Okay, so with video one, we looked at differentiated instruction from a teacher perspective. What does the practitioner think about DI? And also, what are some of the uh, misconceptions or myths about uh, differentiated instruction? Then we heard from uh, Dr. Tomlinson about um, the need uh, to go into differentiated instruction at uh, a, a, not a snail's pace, but at a slower pace. That um, it isn't something that you embrace and engage in and just beat the drums and march right through it. But actually, it is a, a process that you go through that involves collecting data and then looking at for small ways in which you can help students learn effectively and then move on to maybe a more major approach to differentiating or segmenting your class. So um, we're gonna look at another video from Dr. Tomlinson that speaks to um, the differences in the learners. Whoops, let me go back here. And that would be here. <laughs> or not. We know that students come to us with as different people. I mean, anybody who's taught for 15 minutes sees that. Some kids sit still, some kids don't sit still well. Um, some kids come in with a storehouse of information about a particular topic, and other kids have never been introduced to it. When researchers look at differences in our learning, they suggest that there are probably about three, at least, that make a big difference in us. Kids can differ in readiness level. And when students differ in readiness level, that does not mean what is their IQ. It means given a specific set of learning goals, where is the student in readiness for that? You may have a student who's missed something significant last year that would help them move ahead in the subject. As soon as they've got that missing piece, they can move really quickly. And so readiness is not an attempt to pigeonhole a kid and keep them there. It simply means some kids come in with information, knowledge, skills, understanding, experiences that propel them ahead, and others don't yet have that, but we can help them gain it so that they can move ahead as well. In differentiating for readiness, the teacher's goal is really to make everybody's task a little bit too hard for them. So the reason one task won't always work is that typically what's a little too hard for one kid is a little too easy for another one. Something that's way too hard for one student may still be too easy for another. And so looking at what brain research tells us about the fact that the brain really only learns when the task is moderately challenging, and what people like Vygotsky talked to us about with the zone of proximal development, we really do know that a student has to reach a bit to learn but not stretch to the point of pain and certainly not bend down in order to be able to learn. The differentiating for readiness means the teacher is trying to help the students all work toward the same outcome, but at different degrees of difficulty, different degrees of complexity, with different kinds of scaffolding. Interesting point in differentiating for readiness is that if a teacher really challenged an advanced learner, that student would also be the teacher. We often think bright kids are fine by themselves, they're going to make it, and they are going to make it on work that's under challenging. But any student who's challenged will find that they have to stretch and they have to support, have to have support, and that's really the goal in readiness differentiation. Second way in which students bring differences to the classroom is in their interest. And, um, Whereas readiness differentiation is absolutely imperative for academic growth, interest-based differentiation contributes to motivation. So when a student sees something that they like connected to what the teacher's teaching, the stock of that unit goes up and the teacher, the kid thinks, ooh, that's kind of cool, I sort of see that, that's the stuff that I like there. And what we understand is that when students are interested in work, particularly when it attaches to something that they find interesting, their motivation to learn increases. And not surprisingly, when your motivation to learn increases, your um, achievement is likely to go up as well. So whereas readiness and interest are two different entities, they intersect in that way. 
we're not highly likely to be interested in something that is old hat to us and there's nothing new to learn. We're also not likely to be interested in something that's totally beyond our reach. So there's some connections between zone of proximal development and interest, but they really are sort of two separate entities. And by helping students um, boost their current interests, develop new interests, we're building their motivation to learn, and it is way easier to teach when kids will follow you up that hill rather than having to drag them up that hill of learning. The third way in which students differ from each other as learners has to do with what we've called in this particular model of differentiation, learning profile. And learning profile is an umbrella term. And it has to do with how we process information, how we take it in, how we think about it, um, how we interact with ideas. And that actually is sort of a big messy field. There's a lot, um, a lot of different ways to sort of slice that apple and look at it. But in any case, learning profile has to do with efficiency of learning. Readiness is about growth. Interest is about motivation. Learning profile is about efficiency of learning. I can learn something in an inefficient way, probably. It's just much more tiring, much less enjoyable. And so if I can help a student figure out a way to learn that works for him or her, they're much more likely to learn efficiently and therefore to learn better. So what we're hoping for in a differentiated classroom is that a teacher studies student readiness and is able to help kids start where they are and move as fast as they can towards shared goals. That teachers study students' interests and try to connect what they're teaching to things that matter to kids. And that teachers give kids opportunities to learn in different ways so that students learn a variety of ways to learn and become more and more savvy at understanding what's working in helping them learn. Probably important to say that it's not necessary in teaching to say I can only do one of those at a time. Frequently a task can attend to some readiness variance while it attends to some interest variance or some learning profile variance while it attends to both interest and readiness. So the goal is not necessarily to segment them carefully, but to make sure that we attend to those three sets of needs in the students we teach. Okay, so what does this all mean um, for you? What does it mean for you currently with the students that you be that you are working with, and what about your students in the future? The um, the process of differentiated instruction um, usually takes three different forms, um, and these forms a couple of them are pretty basic and then one gets to be a little more uh, complex but is a foundational piece um, as uh, dr tomlinson said you want to um, look at their uh, their readiness and where they can grow you want to be able to motivate them to learn and you want them to learn to learn in a variety of ways so that given whatever um, situation they're given that they'll be able to use um, their skills in learning uh, to maximize uh, the amount of knowledge that they gain and the amount of um, uh, ability that they're or, or the ability to demonstrate that they have. So um, what are those three ways? Well, they're listed here, flexible grouping, unit menus, and tiered tasks. So let's look at them. Uh, first of all, flexible grouping. Um, this is pretty common sense when, when you think about it. Um, it's not tracking. We're not going to decide that Johnny is um, belongs in this group and that, uh, you know, Johnny can't um, uh, do math really well, so that means that he'll always have to function at the lower level in, my, in, uh, in your class. And the reality is that doing math is only a small part, maybe, of what you're doing in your class. And maybe there's only um, specific skills in math that Johnny isn't uh, really um, uh, well skilled in. And so 
Johnny could do a lot of things if Johnny were allowed to be in different kinds of groups. So depending on what you're doing and what you're learning, you put kids together. And those can be in terms of readiness, those can be in terms of interest, and also in their uh, processing of information. What kind of learning style do they have? Speaks to gardeners, work in multiple intelligences. How do they learn and how can they learn to be um, more efficient in their learning so that they can show what they know in an effective manner. So you're going to give students with flexible grouping lots of opportunities uh, to demonstrate in lots of different ways. In unit menus, uh, there are lists of choices. And um, here is how you're going to learn it. And here is what you're going to do to demonstrate um, how you've learned it. And those may go up as uh, choices on a blackboard or on a bulletin board. Um, choices like, uh, just as a for instance, they're going to do, um, they're going to write a poem or uh, a letter or they're going to uh, complete um, this worksheet and then transfer this information into a larger ledger and uh, then explain uh, to their group what the information is that they've been working with. Um, but each student gets to choose what it is that they're going to do. And another way of looking at it is called task cards. And that is um, two th or three, usually not more than three, tasks at a level of readiness. And um, they can be set up on a board similar to what um, you would think of as a tic-tac-toe board, three across, three down, and um, you can assign the readiness levels by the rows or by the columns, but you put activities three uh, across or three down in each of those columns or rows, and then the students get to choose a column or a row, depending on how you've set it up, and they do each of the three. They're meaningful activities that challenge them to learn, but hit them at the point of readiness so that they can effectively manage the time that they have in class and effectively learn. And then tiered tasks are the foundation of um, a lot of work in differentiated instruction. And these are um, looking at the learning goals looking at the task at hand that you want the students to be able to do and then figuring out kind of a um, if you if you could think about it as a ladder where would you put it on the ladder is it more, uh, more difficult is it a higher task or is it a lower task so is it something um, you know in Bloom's taxonomy uh, is it a knowledge based or is it creative Okay, and so what you're looking for in tiered tests are things that are appropriate to their readiness level and also um, that, that you can blend in with the tiered tests, their interest and their learning profile. One of the things that you have to think about with differentiated instruction is technology. Uh, we know kids are tied to their phones or their tablets or whatever. Um, so is it possible that you can use those tools to help them really dig deep in their learning process and demonstrate what they know? So think about, um, is it practical? Is it effective? Or are you using it just because kids like to use their tablets or their, or their phones? And, and I think you know well enough uh, that um, if it's authentic, they will learn well. And technology can often uh, lead to authentic learning. So what can you do to differentiate in your classroom? Well, your assignment for your first two weeks out in methods is going to be to start looking at the data on your students. And so there is an assignment on um, uh, Canvas that you're going to be working with, and you'll start with that in your first day out. Thanks for listening, and let me know if you have any questions.